not enough coffee. It is morning somewhere. Think it is morning somewhere. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sally Hart Peterson, Chair of the Ann Arbor Commission on Disability Issues, and welcome to our May 2018th meeting. We will start with roll call, beginning on my far left with Larry. I'm Larry Keeler, Commissioner. Hi, I'm Kathleen Mozak Batts, Commissioner. Hi, I'm Tim Hall, Commissioner. Matthew Solomon, Commissioner. Oh, hello. Uh, <laughs> I am Zach Damon, Commissioner and Vice Chairman. Rachel Hawkins, Commissioner. Hi, Kirk Westfall, Commissioner and City Council Liaison. Thank you, and I know Allison Stroud, Commissioner and Chair of the PIA Committee, is on her way. First, we start with the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? I move to approve. Larry moves to approve. Is there a second? Zach seconds. Is there any discussion on the agenda? Kathleen. The only thing I see is that the library liaison will not be here today. Yes, thank you. I learned that late this week. So we are going to amend the agenda. Um, the library lady, Katie Monkowitz, um, is at an event all day at or all afternoon at the AADL and was not able to send a replacement. So under presentations A, we're going to eliminate that. I'd also like to make a, a second amendment to that same section and ask that Amber Miller go ahead of Sophie Skoshalak, um, if that's okay with everyone here in our audience, our presenters, as well as everyone on the agenda. Okay. Is Amber and the DDA person? Uh, Sophie Skoshalak is our Ann Arbor Center for Independent Living, and Amber Miller is from the DDA. The DDA will go first. That is what we are requesting, proposing. Anyone else? Larry? No, I just agreed with it. Okay. Any other amendments to the agenda? Hi, Allison. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? No one is opposed, so we will move forward with the agenda as amended. Next on the agenda is the approval of the April 18th meeting minutes. Um, thank you also for Zach, to Zach for vice chairing in my place as I was dealing with a, a daughter with no wisdom teeth, um, but plenty of wisdom. <laughs> of so she reminds me. Um, is there a movement, is there a motion to approve the minutes? I make a motion to approve. I'll second. Second. Are there any additions, amendments to the minutes? Hearing none. Are the minutes approved? All those in favor of approving the minutes, raise, say aye. 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 All those opposed? None, thank you. Minutes are approved as presented. Um, next we have presentations. So Amber Miller, I welcome you to the podium. Hello. Hello. Just, thank you so much for making time with us and for um, moving us up on your agenda. We've got our presentation set here. Doesn't look like it's going to the screen. So we are having some challenges with the clarity of our presentation. Um, we, so we'll make sure that the presentation is available to everybody after the meeting. And if it's helpful, we can provide paper copies as well. They will also be, there will be a link to the presentation in the minutes when they come out. Okay, great. Um, so as I was introduced, my name's Amber Miller. I work with the DDA and I oversee the street improvement projects at the DDA. And with me is, do you want to introduce uh, I'm Neil Bilodeau uh, from Smith Group JJR, uh, and we are assisting the DDA uh, with a few of these uh, street projects. So tonight we want to take a little bit of time and talk with you big picture about what we hope to accomplish with these street projects. Um, and then we also want to talk about some of the details of the projects. They're in a little bit of a different place in the planning process, each of them. Um, so we want to talk about our Huron Street project, our First and Ashley project, and our William Street bikeway. And uh, we're here to get your insight to improve our design, so we want, definitely want to leave time for some feedback. 
I think many of you are familiar with the DDA, but for those of you who aren't, our primary mission is to invest in public infrastructure in order to improve the vitality of downtown. And one of the key ways that we do that is to improve the streets. And um, I think it's easy to just think about streets as a way to move people and cars and bikes, but it's also important that we remember it's a really important place where exchange happens, economic exchange and social exchange, and so we want to make sure that we encourage that through our projects as well. Um, with our projects, we have a number of uh, really important goals, and the, the most important goal that, that's the overarching goal for all of our projects is to improve safety and comfort for all users. So that remains the priority. And then in addition, we focus on promoting green design, strengthening businesses, increasing access and connectivity, designing responsibly, using the dollars wisely, and then alignment with um, the community's priorities, and also to celebrate downtown. We've taken on a number of projects with these principles in mind. Last summer, we um, improved the core commercial area of South University. Right now, you may have noticed that um, Fifth and Detroit near the farmer's market is under construction mm -hmm. um, and will be much better when the project is complete. And then what we want to talk to you about tonight are the projects that are in design. Our Huron Street project, we're focusing on the area between Third Street and Division. And then we are also looking at First and Ashley Streets, the full extent of those two streets, and William Street, the full extent of William Street as well. All right, so the, the presentation we have here tonight is a compilation of several presentations we've given over time. Um, there are some of these slides have a lot of words on them. We're not going to go through all the words. We're just going to hit on the, the key points uh, that we really see with these uh, the, with these projects. Um, and as part of uh, the people friendly streets, we have several um, key concepts that we're implementing. Uh, Amber alluded to them kind of in a universal sense. But one of these definitely deals with safety, comfort and vehicle speeds. Um, I don't think that's anything new uh, in the Ann Arbor area, but safety is a critical community goal and a value of all these projects. Uh, and it's, it's certainly a fact that slower speeds uh, reduce injuries and fatalities. <clears throat> so the slower you go, the less the chance there is for fatality. Uh, another key concept is designing for vulnerable users. And this really alludes to everybody on the street, pedestrians, bike riders, adjacent property owners, uh, business people, people sitting in ca street side cafes, it, it applies to everybody. And the relationship of this is uh, the City of Ann Armour's commitment to the Vision Zero initiative, which basically focuses on no loss of life being acceptable and reducing uh, any type of uh, traffic fatalities. And there are several physical features uh, that are associated uh, with designing for vulnerable users, uh, going into you know, good lighting, high visibility, and creating safe uh, crossings, pedestrian areas. A uh, third concept uh, alludes to the, con the, the benefit of a complete street grid. Uh, Ann Arbor is pretty fortunate in that it has a very vital and active downtown grid. Uh, and, make, and in that manner, it's easier to navigate, uh, provides more direct connections to destinations, uh, and it slows traffic uh, and reduces risky driving behavior. Uh, Two-way traffic also increases visibility for businesses uh, and for shop owners and commercial activity. Uh, fourth key concept, and we only have, there's just one more after this, but it's, this deals with bicycle comfort and level of stress. Uh, there's been a study out of uh, the city of Portland looking at identifying different types of bicycle users. Uh, there's the strong and fearless, which only represent 1%. There's the enthusiastic and confident, which represents another 9%. Those 10% are the ones that are really okay using bike, conventional bike lanes or even riding in the street. There's another 53% that are interested but concerned. Uh, and those are the ones that we're really trying to target here. It's, it's the majority of this group, uh, and providing a network of higher level bicycle facilities will, will increase, dramatically increase uh, bicycle ridership and comfort. 
And then the last uh, key concept we're, we're embracing here is dealing with the, the idea of navigating trade-offs. So the right-of-way space is limited in our streets. We don't have uh, carte blanche on everything. Not every street can accommodate everything everywhere. And so it's about navigating those trade-offs and understanding community values and priorities, and that's how you need to balance these. Uh, so what is clear when we're looking at these streets in general is that what is essential versus what is desired. And that's the two things that we're trying to balance when we're meeting with stakeholders uh, and various people uh, throughout these, these projects. So um, in March, we had our first discovery workshop. It was a week-long workshop. Uh, we are working with a, a national firm, Tool Design Group, uh, who works across the country dealing with street restorations and bicycle facilities. Uh, we came in, and it was uh, very well attended. We had over 131 residents, uh, business owners, employees, and property owners attend. And the beauty of it is we had open houses during the day, and at evening, people could come in and look at their property and talk to the consultants one-on-one -on -one about how these projects could affect them, what their ideas were for improvements, uh, and it, it was really uh, well, well, well attended. Um, prior to that, we also had 29 stakeholder meetings uh, coordinated with various different groups, the State Street Group and various diff different business owners along these corridors, uh, providing insight on, on how they use the streets. So we're going to talk about these, uh, these two projects right now. The first one is Huron Street. Huron is a little bit further along than the first in Ashley and William Street project. Um, this is, a, this, uh, Amber talked about the, the extent of Huron. It extends essentially from 3rd Street on the west to Division Street. That's, that's the corridor we're looking at. Uh, this has been identified as a vehicle emphasis street, but it still needs to accommodate pedestrians and be safe for people. So the, the primary goals of the Huron project are to seek transform, transformational change. Um, Huron is a pretty cold and ha hard place to be for a pedestrian, and so we really want to transform the corridor in, to, to realize some of its potential. Uh, another goal is to provide a sense of protection for pedestrians and improve the comfort level, uh, increasing pedestrian safety at the crossings, uh, and this would be the north-south crossings so people can get across here on to the various commercial districts. Uh, it's important that the design be adaptable to accommodate future street use patterns. That's really one of, one of our, and very important to us. Uh, and we have a target, as I mentioned earlier, of reducing vehicular speed. Uh, and one of the ways we're gonna do that is through implementing what we're calling non-rush hour parking on Huron. So essentially, it's a five lane street during rush hour times. We're, we're suggesting and recommending taking out the two out, outside lanes during non-peak hours for parking. So it becomes essentially a three lane street, one lane east and west and a turn lane in the middle. Um, and then when it comes rush hour again at the end of the day, the parking would be cleared out and it improves the capacity, provides the capacity needed. Uh, and transit use is another goal. We wanna make sure we're, we're, we're coordinating with AAATA uh, on potential trans, transit route changes uh, and, and station changes. And then we wanna be green and sustainable. So uh, th these are just some images now on the screen of what Huron looks like now. Uh, I'm, I'm sure many of us are aware of that. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see this is in front of the courthouse where all the trees have been lost. The trees were planted, they've been lost, they've died. It's a very cold, very uh, hard place to be. The image on the left is in front of the, the newer hotel uh, where they've tried to actually implement some landscaping and tried to create a, a buffer. Uh, but it's still really, as a corridor, lacking uh, in, in the goals we're trying to achieve. I just wanted to point out um, one thing here. When we met with the Partners and Access Committee, um, we heard some concerns about the open tree planters and how the, <laughs> those can be hard to navigate. So that's something that we've tried to address in the design. And so the goals here that we're really, uh, really focusing on for Huron are reducing the crossing length for pedestrians uh, and providing wayfinding. So again, that's the north-south crossing of Huron and reducing that by implementing bump outs. Uh, using this parking during non-rush hour times to provide more of a buffer between pedestrians on the, on the sidewalk and cars and trucks. Uh, improving pedestrian comfort through uh, signalization changes to the the timing of the signalization and facilitating transit use. Uh, and we're implementing a whole slew of other street elements 
that will bring the scale of the street down to the pedestrian level. Uh, these include things like multi-level lighting. We'll have pedestrian lighting on the sidewalk side and then more roadside lighting on, on the roadside, the off-peak parking, uh, putting trees in grates that were, uh, are uh, accessible, uh, not, in, not in pits, uh, using seats in bollards in key areas. Uh, we're going to have curbed planters within the landscape bed, and the curbing will be to prevent a lot of the salt runoff in the winter to get into the landscape bed. And then we're going to be using precast benches at focused areas, and this also serves as a way of protecting people from vehicles deviating off of the street. Uh, this is just an aerial uh, perspective sketch that we've provided looking from, you know, looking from several stories up. Uh, but you can see sort of the pattern of the street trees that we're talking about, the pattern of the lighting. Uh, the lighting will have banners on it, the light poles will. Um, and uh, we've also had uh, meetings with the city forester and we're talking about investing in this project in big trees, not the, not the very small trees, so it can have a little bit more of an immediate impact. Uh, and this is an image of perspective looking uh, east on Huron uh, with just some of the elements we're talking about. You can, there are showing uh, the trees, the tree spacing. We will have the multi-level lighting, uh, precast benches, the curbed planters with the landscape bed. Um, you can see the banners that are on, on the light poles, we're really trying to create a much nicer, more humane environment along, along Huron. And this is one more sketch we uh, have prepared looking down the sidewalk at Huron. And in this case, you can see the parked cars and how they can provide that buffer from the, the vehicle traffic, the truck traffic, and the car traffic in the street. A couple other things that we're doing that are not maybe not so visible, uh, but we're looking at signalization and timing changes on the, on the lighting, on the signals, I mean. Um, and one of those is to have no turns on red because what is happening is people who want to turn on red are not looking for pedestrians. They're looking for when they can make that cut. Mm -hmm. So we want to implement no turn on red along here on. We do want to add a permitted protected left signal phase at 5th Street and basically what that means is it's a phase just for left turns at 5th Street because that's in particular where we've seen a lot of turning movements and when a car has its own signal phase it's a much safer movement for pedestrians and vehicles. Uh, there'll be signal improvements at Chapin and 3rd, if you're familiar with that, that's where the Hawk signal is right now. Uh, and it's, uh, there are a lot of vehicles, we have uh, film documentation of people not, vehicles not paying attention, drivers not paying attention to the Hawk signal going through it yeah. when kids are in the, in the crosswalk. Uh, and uh, the project team and the DDA are working with MDOT to actually uh, install, consider installing a regular traffic light in that location. Uh, and then the non-rush hour parking, which I already alluded to. Uh, this project right now is uh, just finishing up schematic design. It's going to be going into final design uh, through the rest of this year and will be out to bid in the fall of this year, fall or December of this year. Uh, there's still some permitting to do, but the construction is planned to start uh, in the spring uh, of next summer, 2019. Um, do we have any questions on Huron? I have a number of questions. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so um, my, my impulse is that this seems <coughs> completely and totally impractical, but um, so I'm curious about the data, about the volume of pedestrians, the volume of bicyclists, the volume of motorists that currently go through Huron, because the idea of turning that even temporarily into a two-lane road seems completely inappropriate given the volume of traffic that moves through that mm -hmm. space. Um, so I have serious concerns and I also would like to know what the data is on the diet that our other roads were put on a couple years ago leading out to the highway in which that same plan, a four lane road was converted into a two lane road with a, a middle turn lane. What's the data on how that has uh, affected residents in that area, traffic patterns, et cetera, because just common sense tells us that there's a huge volume in a very bustling community, and to try and make it look like Main Street USA and Disneyland may not be the best idea. So if you could provide some research data, I think that'd be very helpful for us to 
get a grasp of why this particular solution uh, has been proposed um, besides the fact of who decided there was a problem with the way that Huron is now articulated? Um, so our traffic engineer is not here this evening, but we could certainly provide that data um, after the meeting. We could send that to you. We cannot, unfortunately, we can't provide data on the, um, the city projects where there have been lane reductions because we weren't involved in that, but we could mm -hmm. ask city staff. Um, this, the direction that we've taken came from the feedback that we received from the public. So, and also the data we collected. So we heard a lot about how busy Huron feels during the peak periods, but how it feels actually quite empty during some of the other hours of the day. And our data helped to back that up. Um, we also heard, and the data reinforced, that during those less busy times, when there are fewer cars on the road, the cars that are there are able to move faster. So that has some safety implications. And um, narrowing it down to three lanes helps to slow those vehicles. Um, so most of it was based on public feedback and then reinforced by data. Um, we can't go into the data tonight, but we could provide that for you. But it, it has been, uh, we, there is a traffic engineer on staff and we've been working with city staff as well to go through the modeling and projections for what, you know, what what the traffic volumes are like, when they peak and when they are, are low. Um, and there's general concurrence that this, this is uh, not, not yeah, It's hard to assess without data. And uh, it seems to me that you're dealing with three separate constituencies here. One are motorists who are uh, seem to be de-privileged in this plan. Um, and then there are bicyclists, which I would say anecdotally seem to be overprivileged in this plan, and that would be interesting to see how much those uh, really costly bike lanes are actually yielding further along here on in terms of use. And then you have pedestrians, which um, again, anecdotally, it would seem to me that there's not a large volume of pedestrians in that area. And as, uh, you know, as a disabled individual who doesn't ride a bicycle, who uh, tries to avoid long walks along streets like Huron, um, it doesn't entirely make sense to me, this plan. Mm -hmm. So Larry? one thing Sorry. I can share about the impact to vehicular traffic and that experience, what, the, what our analysis showed is that if you're driving from one end of Huron to the other, with these improvements, it might take you about 20 seconds longer. So that's, that's the impact to the experience. To the motorist. But to the vulnerable pedestrian, there's a lot to be gained from a safety perspective. Larry. And there are no bicycle lanes being proposed as part of this. This is not a bicycle street. Two things. I, is that, is that here on, one is, is that, uh, is that um, being done with the, uh, the Department of Transportation as well? And two, um, in this, I've been asked to, uh, just mention again that we'd like to put in as many audible traffic signals as we can along that area. So if you're planning, try to plan out for, uh, plan out for audible tra uh, traffic signals. And uh, yes, I am one that does walk a long distance down here and I'll cross everywhere. So, uh, but I, I have been asked to mention that uh, if, if you guys could consider putting mm -hmm. in both of these more audible traffic signals. I happen to love the things at crosswalks. That's great feedback. And this is uh, a, a corridor that's under the jurisdiction of the Michigan Department of Transportation, and the project has been coordinating with MDOT all, the, all along on the, on the process. So there are multiple levels of review. Um, there's our team, and city, then the city reviews, and the state reviews. Okay, we'll continue on then with the first in Ashley project. This is actually a combination of two projects, uh, but first in Ashley, as, as Amber mentioned, is looking at restoring, looking at the feasibility of restoring first and Ashley streets to two-way travel. Um, and it's also looking at adding a protected bike lane in one of the, one of the corridors or uh, an advancing implementation of the tree line as part of this. Uh, and it's all about creating better connections in surrounding neighborhood. So this does the full extent of both Ashley and, uh, and First uh, within, within the city. 
Um, and for those who may not be aware, First and Ashley was made a one-way pair uh, in the early 60s. Uh, it originally was a two-way street, and it was proposed as part of a downtown bypass. Uh, and what is being shown on the screen right now, on the far right, is the bypass was to connect Packard through First and Ashley to Beak Streets to get people around downtown Ann Arbor. Uh, there was a lot of public outcry about that. They did implement the one-way conversions on First and Ashley. Uh, fortunately, I think people would agree they didn't do the rest of the uh, bypass, uh, and so that's what we're living with uh, today. But it has been considered in the downtown development plan to look at this restoration in the future, and I think and the DDA is following up with that at this point. Uh, and the First and Ashley project is actually being combined with the William Street Bikeway project. And the goal of this is to study the feasibility of developing an east-west bikeway, a protected bike lane on William Street. Um, and, and there has been some questions about how, what, why was William chosen for this? Some people have suggested other streets were possible candidates for the protected bike lane. And this is really just the first protected bike lane that's being recommended in Ann Arbor. It's not the only one. And other streets uh, can certainly be considered for that. And William also uh, closes off a loop. What's being shown on the screen now are where the existing bike facilities are in downtown Ann Arbor. They're on First and Ashley. They're on Fifth and Division. They're on Miller, Ann, and Catherine. And this is kind of three sides of the loop. W William would connect, make the fourth side of that loop whole, allowing people to move around Ann Arbor uh, on bikes and have easy access into town. Um, and so these are some of the, the results from the discovery workshop uh, that I mentioned. Uh, really some of the common themes we heard are slower speeds are desired, pedestrian safety is important, uh, improved bicycle facilities were supported, uh, we want to coordinate with the businesses on loading zones, and we also want to expand ADA parking where possible. Yes? I have a question about the first in Ashley. Um, Currently, if you are heading north on Ashley and you want to take a right on Huron by Keybank to head east mm -hmm. on Huron, at that intersection, there is a somewhat protected bike lane that an automobile has to use a center lane to turn into the right to head east, thereby potentially crossing the path of a biker who might be heading straight. So. I think the rule is, as a motorist, you have to look ahead of you, you have to look at the crosswalk, and you have to look behind you, anticipating there's a cyclist that you don't see. Mm -hmm. um, how, uh, that's the only place in Ann Arbor where there's actual, that I've encountered where there's actually a protected bike lane that a, a motorist would have to cross. How, how do you anticipate raising awareness of the traffic law in that situation as more protected bike lanes come in? this but we don't plan on we don't recommend keeping that bike lane on Ashley we okay. recommend moving um, the bike lane to first street so first street would have a bike lane that's going in both directions instead of it being split the way it is today okay and then through signal improvements and other improvements we would clarify we'll actually make it easier yeah. so we'll clarify I'm, who goes when I mean and even help to with cut down unprotected on bike that. lanes you still have that situation where a vehicle will be in the right-hand lane and there'll be a bike lane, but the vehicle has to turn right and cross the bike lane. Who has the right of way, the cyclist or the motorist? If the motor, if the cyclist is going straight. The cyclist. The cyclist would have the right of way. Yeah. And how is a motorist to know that if yeah. the It's part of the motor vehicle is, code is how they're supposed to know it. I know that's a yeah. snappy answer, but yeah. it's, yeah, it's on, the education. Unfortunately, they're not teaching that in driver's The education, <laughs> uh, education will be a component of yeah. this whole Mm -hmm. this whole project but we do plan on having signal adjustments or maybe even separate signals for cyclists that would that would help so that that conflict doesn't exist yeah because a motorist won't doesn't necessarily think to look behind them when they're turning right they look for the crosswalk that they're about to intersect and probably to the right. left as well mm -hmm. but anyway larry i would like to ask a procedural question i was thinking about this because this might go on for a minute this particular presentation um, I, I, I have a friend of mine here for public comment, and okay. I was wondering if we could, uh, 
you know, because I know he's, he's got other things that he needs to do, so I was wondering if maybe we could fit him between the two presentations. A public comment with, oh, sure. I mean. I just wanted, was thinking about moving being, up so okay. I didn't have to That's stay That's fine with our long. next presenter. Um, let's continue yeah, with the. Yeah, yeah we'll, well, there's also going to be questions, so we'll take questions for a few minutes, but then okay. um, any additional questions, I'm happy to forward to you. Either people can mm -hmm. um, contact you directly yeah. or. That would be great. One thing I might say is where we're going with this is to develop a two-way protected bike facility on okay. First and on William. The goal of this is not is, is a couple fold. One is to improve bicycle facilities in Ann Arbor, but the second bigger piece of it is by doing this, you're providing real estate for bicyclists. They're not in the street, so the cars know where the bikes belong. The bikes know where the pedestrians are, so there's reducing the conflict between these three modes. Bic bicyclists stay in their lane, the cars stay in their lane, and the pe pedestrians stay in their space. And it's uh, pretty well proven that that documents uh, interference and in, in collisions. So we can we can move through this quickly, though. Um, so what we're talking about, what was recommended coming out of the discovery workshop, is actually based on based on existing traffic conditions. Uh, it does appear feasible to go to a two-way restoration on both First and Ashley, and that would also include Kingsley going up to Main Street. Uh, we looked at several different configurations for bike facilities and what is being recommended now is a two-way protected bike facility on the east side of First. Uh, and, and looking at William Street, the recommendation is to provide a two-way bicycle facility on the north side of William. Um, and then a couple of the other things that came out of that are to, uh, to put, uh, include bump outs where possible. Uh, look at inter intersection control, so maybe we might be changing stoplights going to four-way stop signs. That's in the analysis right now. Review the lo location and size of loading zones and ADA parking zones. Uh, most of this is generally working within the existing curve. That's, a, that's an important distinction. We're not, we're not tearing up the street to do this work. Um, and these are some images here uh, of just showing one of the things we're talking about in the more residential areas is a concept called a slow street which basically is what exists in the west side neighborhoods right now. They're kind of narrow travel lanes. People have to slow down when, they pose a, a, when two opposing cars come together because they just are a little bit nervous. Parking on both sides, you can have some uh, striped bike lanes, but then um, a slow down kind of narrow, narrow lanes for the vehicles. Um, and so I think this is about the end here. We are coming up with our next workshop. It's actually going to be a design workshop starting the week of or June 4th. Uh, and we'll have uh, flyers out for that. There's an agenda. It's going to be another four-day workshop just like the others. There's going to be presentations on uh, Monday and Thursday evening. And then there will be open houses for people to come in and talk to the consultant team. So that's the Great. That's it. Any other questions? We have time for a few questions, and then we'll we'll move on to the gentleman who wants to engage to address us in public comment. Allison, I just want to say thank you. I really appreciate your time spent on the presentation and be willing to provide information to everybody in the area to give some feedback or question. And I'm sure I'll have some question and I'll refer them to Sally. We thank to you, but I do have one today. Um, after the projects are done, do you anticipate any additional study or review of the impact on the public? And maybe consider a room for feedback from public after the projects are completed. Is, there going to be, is that going to be included in the plans? Um, are you asking once the projects are constructed, if we'll be... Yeah, when everything is done, are you planning to do a review or a study of the impact? that the decision uh, have on the public. Yes, that is something that we um, have talked about wanting to do with this current round of projects, making sure that the projects are actually meeting the goals that we have set for them. So that is something that we plan on doing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Zach, did you have a question? I mean, I did. I did, but I can uh, also forward it. But it's okay. just one question, I guess, about the bike lanes. Really quickly, do you guys know like, how much would that, uh, I guess, you know, minimize the already existing lanes, though, within traffic? I mean, because 
some of the, as you know, some of the lanes are already pretty narrow, right? When there's two-way traffic going on at times. Right. So is that factored in as well? Because I noticed with some of the renderings, they're quite wide. <laughs> so. Well, part of the overall issue here that, that we're considering is that we want to bring cars into the downtown Ann Arbor on sure. our terms, not cars terms. So we're not talking about wide lanes so cars can go faster through Ann Arbor. That's the kind of a general, that's a value decision and that's what we're, how we're approaching this. The lanes will, will be on the narrow side, but they will be within uh, guidelines accepted by the city. Um, so, and we are talking about, so two lanes, north and south on First and Ashley. Uh, two lanes, if you, if you know about William, William kind of weaves back and forth a little bit. We're talking about going to two lanes on William, north, uh, east and west that will allow to accommodate the, the protected bicycle facility on all these streets. So for the most part, what we've identified in the analysis is that there's some kind of unused space or some leftover space that we can reallocate. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Cook. I, I just wanted to re reiterate my thanks. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of Vision Zero or any any effort to improve safety for, for all users. And I think sometimes what gets left out of the discussion is that a lot of these improvements by slowing vehicle speeds, it's not only a, a well-documented benefit to pedestrians, um, but also to motorists, because when there are crashes, they're going slower. And I think sometimes it's, it's kind of counterintuitive and a surprise to folks when they learn really how much uh, how how small the delay, if any, um, that gets introduced uh, to vehicles um, when you remove even you know one lane in each direction, um, you know intuition would say well that means traffic would go half the speed, but in reality you know in case study after case study it's um, depending on the traffic volume again, and I think this is why they're only doing it in off off peak times or planning to do it in off peak times. Um, the delay is really insignificant, and the, and the safety benefits are huge. So I'm, um, I'm glad that this is being proposed, particularly for for Huron. And same with the the one way, um, the two way restorations. I think um, it will be a, a a big benefit to safety. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks Thank so, you much. so much. I appreciate you. your time. Larry, did you say you wanted to amend the agenda so public comment could come right now? I would like to do that. Okay, as long as it is okay with everyone to amend the agenda to bring move public comment up next. Sure. Okay. Sure, sure, yeah. Sophie, May. can you wait 10 minutes? I'm sorry? Oh, I just said, asked Sophie if she could wait. I think Sophie said she was okay. <laughs> She, oh. Yeah, we got the side eye. The side needs to be audible for the me. The side eye of affirmation. <laughs> so. Hello, sir. Welcome. Hello. Oh, my name is Carl Larkins. I live at 100 South 4th Avenue, the high rise there. We have a major parking um, problem that um, inhabit, mm. make it very difficult for wheelchair vans ambulance, police department um, to um, service our building. The problem is this, that one, um, our management has not marked the loading zone. Two, people disregard, don't disregard the parking sign. We end up, we end up having a large number of people parking from our building. They're going to the MC Hotel. They're going downtown. Um, residents that don't feel like going to the parking lot. Um, this Sunday, I got home from church with the wheelchair van. All three parking spaces were full, had to be let off at a different point. Last Wednesday, and I came back. There was a large SUV parked dead center down blocking the um, the ramp so we get on the sidewalk. Um, we have moving vans that 
put in front, put all the ramp, and the people who are moving in park behind the van. Well, we have no access for a taxi or handicapped van to move in, don't, 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 to pick us up. And one of the times, it's even worse. They have been let off on the corner of 5th and 4th across the street behind the um, MC Hotel Alley. I've been let off behind my building. And um, it's very difficult for us to, those of us who are um, disabled and who need to have access to our rise so we could do things and get around when the parking is totally being disregarded by everybody, whoever they want to be. I'll give you a, a, one example. We had one person who kept getting parking tickets, and I messed with them, and they said to me, quote, unquote, it's cheaper to get a parking ticket than it is to pay for the parking. And these, and these are the attitudes we're dealing with. Now with management, I've been in this building for 15 years. The old management took time to paint the lines and so, and so it would be perfectly clear that um, it was a loan zone and these are the parking zones. Now, um, the new management said, it's not my problem. It's the city, it's the city problem, not the city property. And I know I have a friend who have a house. And the city don't help them. Right to take the user property is a native on the on the outskirts, but you are still responsible for the upkeep of that grass and the strawberry or in your trees if you have a home. Why is it not that our management is not responsible for painting the line and the city is responsible for, for enforcing the parking? To me, that decent. <coughs> but, but, but our management do not want to do anything. He said, oh, it's not my responsibility, quote, unquote. And what I propose for the city would be very profitable for the city is this. Take the south end of it and get leave a resident only parking space to unload your car <coughs> and load your car if you don't for grocery and whatever. The rest of it will be necessary for the special vehicles. Turn that into a no parking zone entirely. Oh, I'm talking about a handicap parking with the on diagonal lines so, so people know not to park there. Um, this way, the um, city can make a profit in towing and tickets and, um, and the residents be able to um, get in and unload their groceries and get back down certain time to, uh, to um, move the car to the parking lot. This will stop people from non-resident and resident from pulling into the, um, at the end of that parking area and parking all weekend because they didn't have to pay for parking. We need to have some sort of control for the parking in front of that building for the sake of us who are handicapped and who depends on the vehicles. 
And may I may I address one, one more thing? Sure. One more thing. Um, this presentation was very nice. Talk about no right turn on the year round. But I'm in a wheelchair and I don't and see the RTI. Right? RTI is a right turn idiot. <laughs> okay. They blocked the crosswalk, but we can't get across the street. They won't move the car. And I always count how many times I was stuck in the crosswalk until the light changed. Now, if they're going to improve this, they ought to make it mandatory anywhere downtown. No right turn on red. I'm done. Yes? <laughs> I, I don't think that's proper procedure, but I, I, I wanted to make a, a, a comment on your, on your, you've had been having parking issues down there for quite a while. Yes, we have. And I know, I know for a fact that the problem is who nobody knows who, whether the management of the city is involved. And I know that even uh, people from um, AA, it's so bad that people from AAATA have actually written reports on it. So um, that's how bad it is. So I'm going to make a suggestion and assign some people responsibilities, but it seems to me that we have sort of a confluence of questions about whether or not the right parking infrastructure exists on that block in front of your building in terms of number of handicapped spots and um, permits provided for people who might have be having short-term loading and unloading um, issues in terms of move-in and move-outs as well as um, parking enforcement from the city's perspective. My understanding is the DDA man manages the parking program, but the city is responsible for enforcing parking. It sounds like there's been some uh, a lack of enforcement in that area. It and, has it also, been. and it also seems to me that there's some lack of clarity, as you said, am amongst responsibilities between the building management, the city, and the DDA. And so what I'm gonna propose is that maybe Amber, if you can get his contact information, um, I'm happy to follow up with the city administrator and see if we can put the people together who, who have the responsibility to resolve this and, and get that situation resolved sooner rather than later. Thank you. Do you want you PIA want? to help with that too? Or? PIA, do you want to help with that too? Maybe be the, the organizer of this? So you, I know you're already in contact with Amber. Yeah, I, I am just reading the caption. Yeah, I will be happy to arrange something to talk about this with the PIA, meaning which we will have later this month. So if you don't mind sharing your email address or contact information, we will be happy to follow up with you in any way possible to, in case we have any more questions or to give you an opportunity to attend our meeting. So that way, we can start talking about the next step that we need to take, which not only involves contacting the people that need to get together to determine what the solution is or to determine the potential scenarios. And I think that's all I will say. So, Allison, do you have a contact in community standards who are the people who enforce parking within the city? Or would you like me to get you a contact within community standards so we can loop them in and Amber's here so you can have the appropriate people from the DDA looped in as well. I think that would be helpful to get okay. the data. Yeah. Okay. That would be great. Good. Thank you very We're much. We're on it. <laughs> and Allison, I'm on the committee. I know how to get a hold of them. Great. Thank you, Larry. All right. Sophie, welcome to the podium. Sophie Skoshalak from the Ann Arbor Center for Independent Living. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. That was, we've had some important and very illuminating discussions here. Um, I have to say that my stuff is not as serious. <laughs> um, sorry. So, sorry. <laughs> um, just with the next update with the events at the Center for Independent Living, again, my name is Sophie. I'm the Nursing Facility Transition Coordinator at the SIL. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is something that's popping up again. It's called Girl Talk. It's a social support group for young women with disabilities ages 14 to 26. 
Um, they'll be meeting May 25th, June 1st, June 8th, and June 15th. Um, those are Fridays from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. And if you would like to RSVP, just call our youth services manager, Anna, and her number is 734-971-0277, extension 17. The next thing is something that I already brought up at the last meeting, but I'm just reiterating that we are starting Project Grow Again. It's a fully accessible garden that will be at the Ann Arbor Center for Independent Living. Um, the garden is free of charge. There's weekly group gardening sessions that will be held and everyone's encouraged to come and you know socialize during those times. Um, and we'll also have free vegetable seeds and seedlings will be available to gardeners. Um, some recreation and social opportunities, uh, kind of the same as the last few meetings. We still have free open gym hours. Um, those are Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And if you want some more information on the equipment that we do have, you can email us at info at aacil.org. Um, we also still have computer classes and help. Those are Tuesdays and Fridays, 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, that's, again, held at the Ann Arbor Center for Independent Living. And then we have our general support group. They meet every Wednesday from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. And again, that's held at the Ann Arbor Center for Independent Living. Or you can email Jason Jones at jjones5perad at icloud.com. Um, Diversibility Theater is meeting again every Wednesday from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. If you want more information, you can email Chris Beatty at uh, B-A-T-Y-M-O-H-N at yahoo.com. Lastly, in the social and recreation is we have drop-in art Monday, Thursday, and Friday, um, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Monday and Friday, and on Thursdays, 12.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Um, and you can email art at aacil.org. And last but not least, um, just something that I think everybody should know about. There's a healthy food distribution the third Wednesday of every month from 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. That's at 555 Towner Street, Ypsilanti, Michigan. You can pick up free healthy food including fruits, vegetables, dairy products, and bread. No proof of income or ID required. And it's just while supplies last. I think that's always a good thing to know about. Um, and as always, oh, almost forgot this one because the invitations were hiding under my sheets. <laughs> um, the Ann Arbor Center for Independent Living is having an having open house on June 6. It'll be from 4 to 7 p.m. and everybody's invited. It's just, you know, come and tour facilities, get to know the staff, you know, I'll be there. <laughs> you can talk to me more about my mysterious position. <laughs> um, and then everybody will be there to talk to you, tell you about all of the new things that we're doing. We just um, had like three cleaning days. My arms are very tired. <laughs> um, so I did bring some invitations. Unfortunately, I only have seven. I did not anticipate, but I'm just going to hand them over to you. Um, so if you want to RSVP, I handed them prematurely. It's events at aacil.org, I believe. Um, or you can call us again at 734-971-0277. You can always email us at info at aacil.org, or you can visit our website at www.annarborcil.org. Any questions? Thank you, Sophie. All right, we appreciate it. Excuse me, Sally. Um, yes. May I move up my Ann Arbor inclusive bed? It's going to oh. be literally one minute. I do apologize, <laughs> folks. I'm just on a time crunch. I have to leave. So. Go for it. Your one minute Ann Arbor inclusive update. Thank Go. you. <laughs> All right. Uh, I do apologize. Thank you, Sally, for allowing me to move that up. Ann Arbor inclusive is doing very well. Thank you. Uh, we are in our third season. Uh, we just interviewed a blind hockey player in the Blind Hockey League, uh, David Clank, and that will be coming out. Uh, in the coming week, so be on uh, the lookout for that. And Sally, really quick, um, I just wanted to ask you um, about our upcoming meeting on the 18th. Do you think it would be okay if Kirk attended? I think he would have some 
nice insight on that. The PIA? Uh, yeah, for the one we're going to have at uh, CTN coming up. Oh, wait, on Friday? Yeah. Sure. Okay. If he wants to come at 11 a.m. Yeah. on Friday morning. Yeah, are you able to make that? I have to check. <laughs> are you are you asking just for like quorum rules or? or well, just. Yeah. We can we'll take it offline. We can, okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll okay. take that offline. Okay. Just want to make fun. sure you get your question answered. Yeah. Sure. Okay. All right. And uh, and then we'll be, uh, you know, we'll be taping, of course, next month, and uh, we'll continue to move forward. So, okay. Thank you. Um, and at some point, I want you to meet Dick Carlisle um, as a potential guest. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So watch back today's episode, today's meeting, so you can get all the information you need, and I have his contact information. Too. All right, sounds good. Okay, Thank you. great. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, with no further ado, Dick Carlisle and Valley Adams. Valley is the Director of Expansion for Best Buddies. Um, I've been looking forward to this presentation. We're going to talk about, this is going to be about a new opportunity in Ann Arbor. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Sally. How do, I, how do we activate the PowerPoint here? Um, Come on, Kurt, you know about this kind of stuff. <laughs> can I ask you, Zach, on your way out, can you check with the seat? Oh, wait, there we go. There it is. There oh, got it. yep, thank you. CTN okay. was on it. CTN was on it. That's right. OK, I got it. Um, awesome. Well, hello, everybody. I'm, I'm Dick Hi. Carlisle. I know a few people, Kurt, for years. Um, I'm um, heading up an effort here uh, to help expand the Best Buddies program here in the state of Michigan. Uh, Best Buddies is, is a program that uh, is near and dear to my heart uh, as a father of a 40-year-old daughter who has had a Best Buddy from the University of Michigan now for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. It's meant a lot in our family's life and uh, a lot to a lot of people, especially to the Peer Buddies that, uh, you know, the more I meet, the more I realize how important it is to folks. With me today is Valley Adams, who is the Director of National Expansion for Best Buddies. Valley's here all the way from Tampa, Florida. <laughs> She's the former the state weather. director of the Florida State Office, and now is the Director for National Expansion and has been working with me very closely for the last year and a half to uh, really make this a reality. So I'd like to introduce Valley and have her tell you a little bit more about Best Buddies International in general, and then I'll talk more specifically about how we're trying to expand the program in Michigan. Sure. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. There we go. There we go. So as you can see, Best Buddies International is the world's largest organization dedicated to ending the social, physical, and economic isolation of the over 200 million individuals in the world with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We were founded in 1989 by Anthony Kennedy Shriver. And if you're not familiar, his family, Eunice Shriver, his mother, started Special Olympics. So Special Olympics is our sister organization. And Anthony grew up literally with Best Buddies in his backyard, and, or sorry, Special Olympics in his backyard. And with his Aunt Rosemary having an intellectual and developmental disability, he said to his mom, I love this concept, I love Special Olympics, I love our friends, I love our summers, and having this um, you know, wonderful organization and program starting, but what about every day? What about friendships? What about Aunt Rosemary having friends and being able to socialize and do the things that you know me and my sister and brothers get to do, and go to the movies and have friends? And what about Aunt Rosemary potentially having a job? She has amazing abilities and would make an excellent employee. What about a leader? Why couldn't Aunt Rosemary be an advocate, just like you, Mom, and share with the world the importance of inclusion and acceptance and friendship? And Mrs. Uh, Shriver said, well, Anthony, then do something about that. And he said, OK, I will. And so in 1989 at Georgetown University, him and a few of his friends started Best Buddies. And basically, the mission statement of our organization is to create a global volunteer movement designed to create one-to-one -one friendships, leadership development, and integrated employment for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So at Georgetown University, Anthony and his friends started our first school friendship program. And basically, in short, what that is, is matching students with a disability 
to a student without a disability and creating that one-to-one -one friendship, they become best buddies. And so Best Buddies was then founded. And fast forward to 29 years later, and now Best Buddies is in 54 countries on six continents, and we have Best Buddies presence in every state in the US. So the growth is incredible, and the mission speaks for itself as we move forward to end the social, physical, um, isolation for those with intellectual and developmental disability. So the reason we're here in Michigan is because we do have a presence of Best Buddies here in Michigan. Um, and uh, Richard can talk a little bit about that as far as explaining where we're at in Michigan. However, we do not have a state office in Michigan, which means we do not have staff on the ground to implement all of our programs. We have some of our school friendship chapters here in Michigan, very few. But we also have other programs that are extremely important to the full life cycle of individuals with and without intellectual and developmental disabilities. Best Buddies offers a jobs and integrated employment program, which is thriving and is second to none with regards to our services and placing individuals with IDD into meaningful careers. Um, and we also have a citizens program, which is an adult matching friendship program. Again, one-to-one -one adults in the community with and without intellectual and developmental disability. So until we establish a full state office where we can staff and have staff here locally, which our intent is to have an office here, our first state office here in Ann Arbor is our goal, um, we cannot extend all of these programs to not only Ann Arbor, but the entire state of Michigan. Um, like Richard said, I was the state director of Florida. Um, that started with one, one state office a while back. Now there's seven state offices in Florida um, and over 250 chapters. We have jobs in three of our cities and citizens in all of our, all of our state offices. So um, the growth is immense and we would love the opportunity to showcase Michigan, especially to start in Ann Arbor as a fully inclusive state. And so that's why we're here. So um, we, the reason I got involved obviously is because we've enjoyed the benefit of Best Buddies in our family and have known many people that have. And uh, when I realized that the program was unable to grow in Michigan much beyond what it was, I, I, that's when I decided to become involved and uh, agreed to lead the effort to try to raise the money to be able to expand the, uh, the program in Michigan. My one stipulation was is that we were gonna do it in Ann Arbor. I felt this was the best place for the support, uh, the community, uh, this, this, tonight, just coming to this meeting is a good example of why I, you know, why I think it's a good place to, to have this program. We have the largest, most active chapter in the state in the University of Michigan. We have a very excellent chapter in Eastern Michigan. Uh, Wayne State has a, a chapter not that far away. Uh, there are chapters at Central, uh, Grand Valley, and I'm missing one. Center, Center. Western, Western, Grand Valley, and Central. There we go. Um, what's really great is since we've started this effort, um, the, the word about Best Buddies has gotten out um, enough around the state that it has generated interest in forming chapters in, in, many, uh, in, in several other areas. So we now have a chapter in place and ready to be launched in Oakland University. Mm -hmm. We have a chapter that is forming at Michigan State, which surprisingly our largest state university hasn't had a chapter. So we're, and that, that effort is moving forward very quickly. Uh, we have a chapter at Saginaw Valley State University and a chapter up for Northern Michi uh, Michigan University. But more importantly, we're now getting interest to set up chapters in high schools. Mm -hmm. And as a parent, this to me is the most significant thing because this is the, where I think the biggest impact can really begin. At the middle school and at the high school level where individuals that are there every day in a state of isolation can now be included through the Best Buddies program. And uh, we're, I was telling Sally today, we're very excited because actually the first high school chapter to get off the ground is right here in Ann Arbor at Community. So um, I'm really pleased to be able to come forward and be able to tell you that. So 
I've recruited a, a group of individuals that are helping me. They're mostly my friends, and so they couldn't say no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we are actively promoting this. Um, we've done some fundraising. We've been very pleased. Uh, we did receive a, a grant from the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation, which we're very pleased about. Uh, we've raised funds from individuals. We have an event tomorrow night that we're very hopeful will be very successful. And something I want to make you all aware of and invite you to is on June 23rd, we are having a event, that's a Saturday, at uh, Downtown Home and Garden, very graciously offering us the use of a portion of their facility to uh, introduce Best Buddies to people, to educate folks about what it's all about, and also to sample uh, some gelato that's made by a, a, f a father uh, of ours who owns a company, the Coffee Express, but he's also producing gelato. So that's from 10 to 3 on June 23rd at Home and Garden. If you have the opportunity to stop by, love to see you there. Uh, a lot of what we're doing is promoting Best Buddies and, and educating people about it because it is one of the few, if you know, only programs on this scale that promotes inclusion <coughs> and friendship, which is so vitally needed. You know, our population is still very much isolated. Uh, we still have so many young folks living at home with their families, and, and once they reach 26 and they're out of school, their life, from a social standpoint, pretty much ends. I know that from experience. Um, but Best Buddies is a solution, and the more chapters, the better. And uh, if we can see the kind of growth that we see in Florida, and uh, I have to tell you, I mean, we already have a rival to our south in Ohio that opened up their state office, uh, I think, the first part of last year and is growing like gangbusters. So we have that potential here, and we have a lot of work to do and a lot of geography to cover, but I think we can grow Best Buddies throughout this state, and we can do it from right here in Ann Arbor. So thank you very much for your time. Questions? I just want to say uh, how much I admire what you're doing here and uh, how important I think it is uh, as a former Tampa resident. I'm uh, delighted to, to see some uh, Floridians uh, up this way. Uh, it's hard to get her up here except until this time of year, by the way. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I've been here a lot. She's been, been here a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you remind me again of the open house, uh, the, the date and time of that June open house? It's June 23rd. It's at Downtown Home and Garden, and it's from 10 o'clock until 1 o'clock. You'll probably see us out on the front of the sidewalk if it's, the weather's nice under the awning, serving gelato, you know, teaching and hoping to inform people about best buddies and, and, and having fun. And uh, the chapter at Community High School is active now, is that correct? As a matter of fact, it is being formed, uh, it is being organized, and it'll be, the organization is starting now, it'll be launched next uh, year when school starts when school up again, opens in the fall. when school opens in the fall. But it's amazing that, and I saw the same thing at Oakland University, once these young folks are motivated to do it, boy, they really take charge and they're ready to go. They're organized, they've got officers and they're ready to go. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Allison. Oh, Rachel. Oh. Go, Rachel. <laughs> I also wanted to thank you for this presentation. I'm so glad that Best Buddies is focusing on expanding into Michigan. I think this is such a need and has been for some time. Um, my, my questions were mostly related to if there's a way um, that people can contact you, a website, if they are interested in forming, um, forming a uh, chapter, because I'm aware of people in different parts of the state that you haven't mentioned that would be highly interested in this. I, I'm going to pass out a brochure that we've, we've prepared, uh, which has got my contact information. Uh, your chair has my contact information. Anybody and everybody that wants to know more about it can contact me. I will talk to anybody about this, and I would love to. What's been really great, too, is the fact that this isn't just, um, this isn't just our effort. What has happened here is that we have gotten so much support from the national office that when we are, we are a high priority to, to, have, a national, to have a state office here, um, primarily because they have gotten so much interest expressed to them on, you know, through their website from people in Michigan. And so they know that the demand is here. And so I, don't, I, I, felt, like, I, I felt like we have gotten tremendous amount of support. And so once 
we find people that are interested, um, we, we follow up on this, and, and that's why I think we're being successful getting this, getting this word out and, and, and this movement really started in Michigan. Just to share with you as well, like a national statistic, um, there are 22 states that do not have a state office. Of those 22 states, we've prioritized seven as our top, what we're calling our super seven. And again, that's based on the need, the request, um, you know, population, corporate support within those states, uh, and many other factors. Um, but happy and very proud to share with you that of the seven, of the 22, the number one state that's slated to open this year is Michigan. That is our top priority. Hold on, Allison had her hand up first, and then Kathleen, and then I have one more. Okay, I have, I, I'm really happy that you know, trying to set up a state office here. I think what I may have missed during the presentation while I was taking notes is, can you tell us, or remind us a little bit more about the role that the state office is playing sure. overall, sure. because I know about the chapters and how they interact with each other and the kind of activity and that they achieve at the yeah. university or at college. What are the roles or what is the role that the sure, state office question. would play? That's excellent. And so as we mentioned, we have six now growing to close to 10 chapters. But at this point, we have to stop because we cannot support those chapters without a state office, thus meaning staff here on the ground. Mm -hmm. So once we achieve our funding initiatives, which is 250,000 secures the office to open and sustain for one year. That will hire a state director to oversee the entire state operations, um, as well as relationship management and development. There'll be a program manager who's gonna implement um, and develop and manage programs, which is going to be our school friendship programs, as well as our citizens program. And we're also gonna hire an employment consultant or a jobs developer, depending on what our needs are most highest, so that we can implement and right away get going with our jobs program. So until we have the staff here on the ground to actually support, develop, and sustain these programs, we cannot continue expansion mm -hmm. into those programs. Kathleen. Um, I was just wondering if for the public we could uh, post your website um, right now, if you could okay. give that information so that the public can have it. Absolutely. We can put it on the disability resource okay. page. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, did you have another? Sorry, did I cut you off I too soon? Sorry, a Allison. I have a You've, sp you've spoken about the funding mechanism for the first year. Have you already uh, clearly for a future year funding mechanism? Because I'm not sure what the fundraising efforts look like mm -hmm. and how you plan to mm -hmm. sustain the program long term. Uh, I'll just let me start and then you. Sure. Yeah, you, Absolutely. I will tell you that this that has been the con that has that started out as the number one question from the committee members that I recruited to do this. Because, uh, you know, here we've seen a lot of initiatives in, in our town here of nonprofits that have started and, of course, failed for lack of sustainability. Mm -hmm. So one of, so, so part of our effort really has been to, is to identify and locate more long-term sources of sustainability from that standpoint and funding so that it is not a, you know, a one-and-done type of effort. Go ahead, Valley. So part of our process in, in making sure we have sustainability is to follow our mission statement, which is simply a global volunteer movement. So Richard is part of our global volunteer movement. He, he is leading the charge. He has a committee. We're, we're reaching out. We're informing those. We're leading with our mission. We're opening our chapters. So by leading with our mission, we're hoping to show the impact and the results of our mission and our scope. And then after the first year, once, once we put staff in place, the staff then is going to lead with those efforts. They're going to be here on the ground developing the corporate and community partnerships. Uh, we also will do annual events, as most nonprofits and 5013C organizations do. Um, once the state office is opened, we also have a government relations team within our organization who will then start interacting with the government in Michigan, the state government and securing government funding as well. Um, then there's the local and, and statewide foundations. We'll have a grants team also in place within our organization assisting Michigan as a state office to ensure 
Um, you know, we receive grants as well. We've already gotten a few. We're continuing to apply. Um, so that's really how we sustain it by growth, mission impact, um, volunteers, and then we'll have our staff in place. So is that? One of the questions the, that, uh, as a follow-up to that, one of the questions that our committee asked, you know, when we started to get more information about is, of all the state offices that have been established so far, how many failure, failures have there been? Well, there really actually haven't been any. There's only been one office, state office, that was open that was closed, and that was in, I believe, Utah, and that was for totally different reasons than lack of funding. It was just logistics, the distances, you know, the lack of concentrated population. Every state office that has opened has continued to thrive. And I think part of the reason is, as Valley mentions, is that the mission is what really sells the program, and it's the, it's the vast volunteer network that comes out of that that are really driving, are driving the, you know, driving the bus here, really, from that standpoint. So, um, I mean, we're, you know, everything is a challenge, but we're pretty confident that we're laying the groundwork here for a more long-term operation to be able to be sustained. Great. Kirk. Thanks. Uh, thank you for a, a great presentation, um, uh, and, and it's, it's an honor that you've come to this commission to, to share this really significant news, which is, uh, I think, will become a, a huge source of pride for, for Ann Arbor. So mm -hmm. selfishly, I love that you found Dick, and he's, <laughs> he's an Ann Arbor booster, and yes, we're making absolutely. a go of it here. Very uh, uh, a, couple, a couple of things. Um, so is, is space something that you're looking for? I mean, you're looking for partnerships to get office space for your staff? excuse me, staff, or is this something that, uh, a separate effort that no, you would make? No, absolutely. Once we, you know, start that hiring process, which we're hoping is January 1 of 2019, that's our goal, mm -hmm. that's our plan, um, we absolutely will reach out to our volunteers, to the community, to, to help and assist, and that is extremely welcome. Yes. Okay. And, and it sounds like you have a pretty significant footprint here. Are, are you still looking for uh, families uh, or, or, or folks who are, interested in partnering um, in this program, or do you have more than you know what to do with? Or, or, no, 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 <laughs> we're both shaking our heads. <laughs> Again, Global Volunteer Movement, we want everyone and anyone that is interested, has a passion for our mission, has a passion for friendship, inclusion, acceptance, to please join our movement. Yeah. Anybody, as we, we look um, for corporate and community partners, we look for volunteers, um, as Richard said, we have the event on June 23rd. We also are in the process of putting together a friendship walk, which Best Buddies International takes place. They host a friendship walk in every state and all of our 54 countries, we host a friendship walk. We're looking to do that at the end of September. We are yet to confirm a venue, so I don't wanna speak out of turn, but just to say that it is coming. Um, and that is a full community celebration of Best Buddies, inclusion, acceptance, friendship. And we're hoping to make the announcement at the walk that we have officially crossed our finish line and we will be establishing the first ever Best Buddies Michigan State Office. Wonderful, thank you. That's great, thank you. So we would appreciate you helping spread the word. Yes, please. This is, the, this is what we could ask of you. Um, this is a community effort, you know, it's gonna be a state effort eventually, but it's starting here and whatever this group can do to help support our effort and spread the word about what we're trying to do, we greatly appreciate it. So. Do you have a Facebook page? Not yet. <laughs> that might be a good we have thing. A, we have a regional one which okay. we can provide yeah. to you. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know, I'm, I'm, a little low, I'm a little on the low tech side. <laughs> <laughs> you need to get those U of M students. Yeah. Find a teenager. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Great, again. any other questions? Thanks again. We Thanks, this is fabulous. Thank you everyone. Yeah. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you. Okay, next, um, no one here is left for public comment. Old business, city personnel report, Heather was not able to stay. Hopefully we'll get that next time. Chair report, I have a couple of things. The Bloomsday event um, oh, that yes. we typically take, play, take part in every year is actually this Saturday, May 19th. It begins at 9 a.m. at Liberty Plaza. And this is an event um, every year. It's actually sponsored by the DDA and the State Street Area Association. 
it's an opportunity for the community to come together and work on cleaning up the, the plantings in the garden areas that are located within the downtown. Um, it includes cleanup of the sensory garden that um, we all had great, took great part in creating several years ago. Um, the Lions Club will be there to assist um, anyone from our community who wants to help with the sensory garden. I strongly encourage um, commission members to show up. Um, but anyone from the public who is interested is, is welcome to come um, clean up the sensory garden. Um, to volunteer, you need to call Give365. Um, that's part of the Parks Department, I understand. Um, their number is 734-794-6445, or you can email volunteer at a2gov.org to say that you want to come and volunteer. Check-in is a, the event runs from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Um, Check-in is at Liberty Plaza, and afterward at 11, there will be pizza at Liberty Plaza for all the volunteers. Additionally, on June 2nd, Adopt a Park is funding um, the replacement of some of the plants that didn't make it last season. Um, so there'll be the May 19th event is for cleaning up. The June 2nd event is for some replantings. And Adopt a Park is going to um, cover the cost of the plantings. Um, but we're looking for people to volunteer to help replant some of um, the different species that are there. To vol I don't have the timing on that yet for June 2nd. It's also a Saturday. Um, but you can email a2disabilityissues at gmail.com. That is our commission email address. I get those emails, so I will forward those um, people who are interested to the right person. Um, yes, Larry. The, the, OK, so can you, can you just show up again, too? Can I think you, show you can just show right up. It takes a little bit of extra time yeah. if you just show up. They like to know how many people are coming, right. so how much well, pizza you, to you, order. You know, I've, 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 I've usually been involved with it, so I'm thinking about coming down, but yeah. I'm not sure. i got to make sure I can do it. Yep. It would be good if you gave them a call ahead of time just so they know they have enough pizza for you. Okay. Well, they, um, they have to have a truck for me. So. <laughs> I like pizza. The second thing is a little bit more on a personal note. Um, if, if, as you recall from the bylaws, the chair position is a two-year position, and no chair can serve no more than two consecutive two-year terms. And in December, I'm coming up on my fourth year as chair. So it is time for a new chair next year. And the good news is that next year is the 50th anniversary of the Ann Arbor Commission on Disability Issues. Wow. So, as we all collectively recruit a new chair or think about who might want to be doing it, think about an agenda of having a very celebratory year, um, 50 years in Ann Arbor. Um, also, according to our bylaws, it is up to the recruiting committee to <coughs> nominate um, potential candidates. I know in the past we've used a nominating committee that has been put in place temporarily. We can do that if you if you like, um, but our bylaws specifically call out the recruiting committee and doesn't really make mention of a nominating committee. So um, I will ask for people to step up and help manage the process of recruiting candidates for a new chair and managing, it'll be a voice vote um, or a roll call vote um, at our November meeting is when we elect oh, a new okay, chair. Good. Okay. It would be the term technically starts December first. G gives me um, time then. Yes. Um, any questions, Kathleen? Okay, so I'm really sad because I've enjoyed your mentoring and um, thank you. My question to you then is, and this is kind of maybe personal, uh, will you remain with us as a commissioner, or are you stepping down at that point? Um, I'm undecided on that. I think. For the short term, I'll remain on at least for a few months to help with transition. Um, what I'm finding um, more and more, two things that are going on. One is I've taken a role as economic development, executive policy advisor for economic development for the city of Ann Arbor. Um, and there have been times when I haven't been able to vote on or give an input from this table, which you may not have been aware of because the one thing I couldn't give input on, I wasn't at the meeting anyway. So. Um, there are opportunities for there to be conflict of interest between um, role as chair 
and the work I'm doing in the city, that would certainly benefit people with um, who have disabilities. So when it comes to funding, that's when the conflict of interest mm -hmm. comes in. Um, the second thing is I am anticipating within the next couple of months to become a legal guardian for my sister Betsy in Massachusetts. Um, I'm not moving to Massachusetts, but we do have a second home there, and I'm going back and forth quite a bit. Um, and I have in the last several months, and I expect to in the coming months. So I, I, you know, my passion is still with this commission. I get so inspired by best buddies and groups like this that come and talk to us. Of course, that is close to my heart, having a sister who is developmentally disabled. But um, I expect to be involved for some time after. That's a really long answer to your short question. Sorry. Larry. Well, you can still be vice chair. I could me. still be vice chair. Still, <laughs> well, my, my, I, I, you know, what I was thinking about, I was sitting here and I'm thinking, we're all green. So, you know, you wanted uh, to, to push us green. along. This is a group that's been around the block a few times. Anyone else? All right, so think about it. Um, if you'd like to become part of the recruitment process, let me know, and I will leave it all in your good hands to do that. But as always, I'm always available, if not in person, by email and by phone, and you all know how to reach me. Um, but again, no transition until December, so we have time to think about it. So, okay. Um, Rebecca is not here for the Community Engagement Committee meeting. We've heard from Zach. Next, Allison, Partners in Access. Okay. I do not have anything to report at the moment because I was not in the country in time for the PIA meeting last <laughs> month, and I was sick earlier this month, so I'm actually going to send an email to Heather, Clark to that's what I mean for later in May. And I want to say thank you to everyone who sent me their conflicts for later in May, so that way I could keep those in mind when I'm trying to schedule the next PIA meeting. And I uh, already have a few agenda items to cover. So that will be expected during the discussion. And one last thing to report, and I apologize for the inconvenience, but I will actually be out of state for the next PIA meeting for a work trip. So I will have to reschedule the June PIA meeting. And I do hope that with the job that I have going on right now, with the responsibility that I have, I am transitioning to a new position starting in June. So I hope that I will have more time to be more involved with the Disability Commission because I'm really min missing out on a lot of things. So I'm kind of sad about it, but I'm excited about it the changes to come and the flexibility that I will have in order to be more involved for the commission. So that is all I have to report, and I will be in touch with you all about the June PIA meeting. Let me know if you have any questions or any items that come across your lap that need our attention in terms of accessibility and safety. Please email me, and I will add that to our meeting agenda for when we have the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. If no one has any questions, I am done with my report. Thank you, Allison. Any questions? No. Okay. Uh, Larry, recruiting. I know you have news. I don't have a lot of news. You have some news. Matthew, Matthew and I still have to get together eventually, but the the other news is that we do have one app. How many? How do we still have two open vacancies currently? Yes. Okay, good. We have we have one potential applicant coming up, and and um, the the stuff hasn't been released to Sally and I, so we haven't seen it yet. But she looked she looked good so far. So um, if if the two of us do it and look at it and think it's all right, well, they'll send it to City Council Monday, and I. I think it looks good there, um, and I have a I have another person who is quite interested. I went up to the mayor's office this morning, grabbed a couple applications, and and she uh, should be putting in hers too soon. So if you want to become part of our commission, you can either call seven nine four six one six one, or you can submit your questions to. Um, 
a2 disability issues at gmail.com or I think it's on the I, there's a there's a, a spot for um, commission uh, boards and commissions where you can get an application online at the a2.gov website great thank you any questions for Larry Next, we have Tim. Yeah, so Transportation Commission uh, met last week, and they also met, I think, after the last meeting. But I know some of the big things they were talking about uh, Fuller Road, they're uh, at, like adding sidewalk in on the side, like over by Huron High School and the uh, uh, Gallup Park. And they're also like looking at moving the crosswalk to make it, because I guess where it was, it's like, currently a hazard and I think yeah there's been I don't know if that's where it was that where there was the accident yeah, where someone died town, like yeah. yeah the the full road thing yeah 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 um, and uh, yeah so they're looking at moving the crosswalk so it's more visible to vehicles and closer for uh, people to actually get over to where they're going and also uh, they talked about the South State Street corridor. They're looking at making some changes there for both pedestrian and vehicle, and perhaps with bikes, like as well. It's, they've been doing a study, and also got some updates on like uh, I think for Research Park Drive, they're still talking to AAA TA and. Uh, Trying to see, doing some studies to see what they could do, like what the traffic warrants over there, and you no, know, that seems to be a long process. It seems like they've always been doing studies over there, but uh, and uh, like the other thing was the Washtenaw and Pittsfield. It seems like they've been waiting for someone to come out and do some kind of analysis as far as the state before they could actually get going on that. So, is that the reimagined Washington? No, no, that's the crosswalk over by where Arboland is. Oh, yeah. And, uh, oh, Pittsfield Street. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm, t but uh, that's, so yeah, they're gonna do that study, it looks like sometime this year and you know, it'd be like next spring slash summer that they would be doing any construction. But at least we finally got updates on those two items, which, yeah. The other thing is they had the RTA public meeting that I sent the email to. Mm -hmm. uh, that was that took place. I went there. There wasn't a huge turnout, but uh, yeah, people give in their comments on the plan, and uh, they had several of them like in. Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb counties, and uh, they're going to go back to the board, discuss any changes, and eventually vote on whether they're going to put this, move this plan forward, which the vote there, there's some questions as to what's going to happen, and there might be a chance of a Wayne and Washington only plan there. But still watching this, I mean, I offered some comments because I noticed like with the plan, there was a number of the routes that were going from Ann Arbor to Western Wayne County were like peak hours only and only designed to work for commuters from like Plymouth and Canton to Ann Arbor and not vice versa, not offering like the connections to those communities. Like there was one off peak line that went through Ypsilanti, but, and then the commuter rail of course, which is obviously a big thing, but and they also offered some suggestions of, yeah, more off-peak, maybe some bus, supplement the rail with buses, and just, yeah, because, but yeah, that's, feel free to, I think they're still taking comments by email, and I guess that's all I wanted to report on. Are there any questions for Um, next, we have Kathleen reporting on the U of M Council for Disability Concerns meetings. Um, so I don't know if you know, but the Council for Disability uh, Concerns has been around for 35 years. And one of our past commissioners, Anna Eskerel, or Schnitzer, and Bonnie Didi, who wasn't a commissioner, they compiled a book, and it's titled Diversity Includes Disability, 
Perspectives on the U of M Council for Disability Concerns. It's the first historical summary of the 35 years of the Council's existence, and it was just published as a Mazed book by Michigan Publishing. It is available online, also in paperback, at www.publishing.umich.edu slash publications slash maze hyphen books. And I also know it's available on Amazon.com. Oh, yeah. oh, nice. So very exciting. There were two major presentations given at our meeting. One was by Patty Bradley, Andy Burkhart, and Frederick Lobepin. Uh, they highlighted the fall winter workshops called Accessibility 101 that was for postgrads and instructors. Basically, it, it was about every, it's everyone's responsibility to uh, include accessibility, why it's important giving basic guidelines, tips, strategies, why captioning is important, discussing barriers, and what they call the four principles, or um, core, P-O-U-R. So in other words, that is an acronym for four high-level principles that describe functional accessibility. So it's perceivable, meaning that the user can identify content and interface with elements by the means of their senses. That it's operable, meaning that a user can successfully use controls, buttons, navigation, and other necessary interactive elements. That it's understandable and it's appropriate to the audience in its voice and its tone that the technology is consistent in its presentation and format. And that it's robust, that it's standard compliant, and is designed to function on all appropriate technologies. While this discussion was mainly on web accessibility, they said that it could really apply to any accessibility question. So that was very exciting. The last uh, thing on the agenda, we had a presentation by a student named Pratik Sharma. It was about um, proposing a website or a blog about accessibility at the University of Michigan. It was created by this student and all other students of Melanie Yurgao's Disability Studies class. They're hoping it's going to go live in the fall for potential current, for potential and current students. And it sounds very exciting because it would be a warehousing place where disabilities uh, can um, be included, they can find out location, accommodations for, uh, for SSD, all forms, implementations, and whatnot. It's sort of to be centralized, something to be centralized. So, um, thank you. That's all I have. Great. Any questions for Kathleen? Um, I have, I'm just going to sneak this under announcements, something I forgot to update on that I saw Kathleen and it reminded me. Um, we had been involved in um, the lack of curb cuts in the parking area at Briarwood. Mm -hmm. And I have been in touch with mall management and they explained to me that sometimes, it, it, depending on the store, um, some of the stores own the parking lots and some of the sidewalks. So it isn't necessarily fall under Briarwood's jurisdiction. Um, Erica Williams is a woman I'm working with, and she said, I sent her the pictures that you had taken. Um, she said she would follow up with management and then follow up with those particular areas. Who owns that area? Is it the city? Is it Briarwood? Or is it, for example, Macy's? It could be. Um, I think I owe her a follow up. She emailed me um, a couple of days later, but it was a blank email. Oh. And I think she meant to email me something, and I need to follow up with her. But um, I think you were copied on it as well, and I think Allison might have too. I um, was, but I was confused. <laughs> you were as confused as I was. So we, we got a response of no response, and I need to make sure she understands that you know we're still waiting. So I'll follow up with her on that one. Um, may, any other announcements? Yes. May I just t tack on to that a little bit? Yeah. Um, I, I'd be happy to. Uh, to look at that or, or, or just I'll make my suggestion now. So uh, I had experienced when my dad was staying in the um, assisted living place on South Main, just, okay. just north of yep. there, yeah. that in order to walk from there, uh, the sidewalks are 
one issue next to an office building there, but once you cross Eisenhower and get on, you know, Firewood toward the, the mall yeah. circle, mm -hmm. and I don't know which is, again, City Street, uh, Outlots, or Mall. Um, I guess you'd have to look at a parcel map, but there is not a straight shot to the mall. No, no, no. <laughs> um, yeah. And not even an, an inferred possible um, accessible path. So um, I, don't, I don't know. It probably warrants an entire study of who's yeah. coming from what direction and, right. and so on and what's going to be the most impact to, to curb cuts. Um, it's, it's, but, yeah, um, you can't really cross Briarwood Circle except in a few areas. But if you're entering in from South Main Street, you cannot then cross over right there from it, South Main Street. No. It's difficult, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah it's difficult. <laughs> okay. Thank but you. thanks for pursuing that. Yeah. Any other announcements? Um, our next meeting is Wednesday, June 20th at 4 p.m. We'll see you all there. Thank you. We are adjourned. Uh, oh, wait. Oh, sorry. There's business. an announcement I missed. Did you, did we are not skip adjourned. New business? Sorry. Oh, sorry. New business. She just deleted new business. I know. I'm sorry. I went right to the I know we've been a long time. Sorry. You know? I know. New I, business. Yes. Kirk. I was remiss in not mentioning this during the approval of the minutes. I believe I was here last month, so I don't need, uh, I don't know if I should ask to reopen the, the, the minutes and, and reconsider my absence listed under the roll, um, roll, roll call. Or we can officially ask Heather, because she's watching us or will be watching us, to amend the minutes from the April 16th, April 18th, 18th meeting mm -hmm. to reflect that Kirk was here and not absent. Thank you. Yeah, he was here. I didn't have to think of it. Person? Any other new business? New business. Okay, next meeting, Wednesday, June 20th, 4 p.m. We are adjourned. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for your patience.